Put your hands together. Let's just worship Jesus. We love you, Lord. We exalt you, God. We magnify you, Jesus. Be glorified today. Be lifted up. We worship you, Lord. Oh, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Welcome to Vox Church. I just want to say right now that we are so glad you decided to join us this Sunday. God bless you. If you're with a family member, friend, watching on your couch, watching at your kitchen table, turn to them and say, welcome to church. Come on, tell them, welcome to church. We switched things up a little bit. We got a new series. So we got a new background. And I have some new friends in the studio with me today. So I asked a bunch of, uh, of our staff to join us because at church, I just felt like I had been preaching uh, to my faithful camera friends for so long that it was time to just invite a few in with us. So uh, thank you. Thank you, family of God. Thank you. I have more pastors in a single room than, uh, than we've ever had in an actual Vox Church service. But thank you, guys. We love you. And, um, and welcome to church. Welcome to church. If you have a Bible, Ezekiel chapter 37 is where we'll go. And so if you want to take it out on your phone, on your tablet, or on a physical piece of paper in which the scriptures are written, it's all good. But I encourage you, follow along with me. Ezekiel 37. I want to read 10 verses that if you've been around church, you may have heard. I've preached them before. I've got something fresh for you today, though, and I really believe it's from the Holy Spirit for your heart. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and, I, and you will come to life. I'll attach tendons to you, make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. And I will put breath in you and you will come to life. And then you'll know that I am the Lord. And so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. And I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy son of man and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath. Somebody say, come breath, come breath for from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. And so I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them and they came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. What an amazing picture. What a powerful vision that the prophet Ezekiel has right in your home today and all of those that are with me in this gathering today, would you bow your head? Would you open your heart? I believe God has a profound personal word for you. I've been praying. I've been asking the Holy Spirit. I believe he's given me something that goes right into your situation today, right into your need in the deep places of our hearts. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for the friends that are gathered here. I thank you for the thousands that gather with us in homes all across New England and beyond. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you right now to speak a fresh word in this time, in Jesus' name. Would you move in my heart? Would you make me new? Would you do something fresh in me? Come on, just ask him that. Would you even say that out loud? Lord, do something fresh in me. Go ahead and say it. Lord, do something fresh in me. If you're following on a chat, you can put it in the chat. Lord, do something fresh in me. In Jesus' name, amen, 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 amen. Are you excited to be at church today? Are you excited to worship Jesus a little bit? I am. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. We start a new teaching series today. We got a new look for Vox Church online today. 
And uh, we start a series called Dream That Dream. Dream That Dream. We're going to be talking about personal vision. Personal vision. You know, this is a personal passion of mine. And so I'm excited to take the next few weeks and focus on this topic. Are you living with a profoundly clear personal vision for your life? Who do you want to be? Tom, who do you want to be in five years? Who do you want to be in 10 years? Who do you want to be in 15 years? Where do you want to go? What do you want life to look like? Do you find yourself right now living with a profound sense of God-given calling? You know, if you're like me, this past week was kind of defined by a storm, right? Some of us lost power. Uh, some of us had trees fall down in our yards, or, or at least we got some pickup to do. You probably were inconvenienced if you're in the New England area in some way by the, the hurricane force winds that, that ripped through. I don't know if it quite made hurricane status, but it was, it was pretty significant. And uh, I think vision is a little bit like a hurricane. Vision, this idea of personal vision that, you know, just as on the outside, a hurricane kind of changes the landscape, so on the inside, the hurricane of vision is a force. It's a force that gets inside of us and it stirs up our souls. I love the way the prophet Jeremiah described it. He said, it's like a fire shot up in my bones. And he said, I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Now think about your life, Steph. Think about your life right now. Are you living with a fire shot up in your bones? Are you living right now with a personal vision that is changing the internal landscape and then the external landscape all around you because it's burning inside you? I remember years ago hearing someone talk about vision, and this has stuck with me for years. They said, vision is a picture of the future that produces passion. It's an image that I see. It's somewhere that I feel God's called me to go. It's something clear that is in my heart for the future and it produces in me a passion. And I think a lot of times we misdiagnose the issues of our heart, not realizing that we're living with a lack of personal vision. And I wanna suggest that many of us that are listening right now, maybe you haven't even realized that you lack a sense of personal vision that there doesn't seem to be this burning, clear picture of the future. And so, you know, maybe you've kind of like tried to change jobs or tried to, you know, shift up your career focus or introduced a new relationship in your life or went to that latest show or that latest, you know, movie that you watched, whatever, you know, you do to kind of try to spark some excitement. But, but if your life has ever felt a sense of aimlessness, if you've ever felt a sense of kind of lacking direction and focus, the root of the problem is a lack of personal vision a lack of God-driven, Holy Spirit-given, supernaturally anointed vision. And I think, if you're anything like me, this COVID-19 months and months and months now that have kind of perpetuated and become a new way of living for us has perpetuated what I would just call vision drain. You know, because you plan something and then your plans get interrupted. You, you decide something and then you have to redecide it because everything changes. You thought it would be open, but it's not quite open. Vision drain over time. I know that these last five months I felt, and I'm a pretty vision driven person, the slow draining of my tank in this area of vision. Have you felt that at all? I remember um, years and years ago now, 16 years married, I was uh, on my way to my honeymoon with my wife. We got off the airplane in Florida. We had two weeks. We had a week in Pompano Beach, and then we went to Disney World because we were 21 years old and didn't know what to do with ourselves on our honeymoon. So we said, let's go to Disney World. And so, so we get in the car in Florida, got out of the airport, and we're driving the rent-a-car. You know, looking back, I don't even remember how I, you know, got them to rent me a rent-a-car at 21 years old. But we got in the rent-a-car and we're so excited. We've got all this vision for the next two weeks. We're so excited to just be together, to be married and all that, you know, we're looking forward to. We're gonna go on rides in Disney World and have so much fun. And I remember we got in the car and if you've ever been to Florida, you know, during the rainy season, like this thunderstorm rolled in and for hours just completely blinded our visibility to the point where I'm sitting on the side of the road, the, the car getting pounded by this storm of rain, and I can't go anywhere because I just can't see. And I think that for some of us, that's how life has felt these last few months, where it's like I had a plan, I had a vision, and now I just, I can't see. So it's so hard to plan when you can't see. And so this aimlessness starts to set in, and your heart can begin to feel a little bit like dry bones, a little bit like a valley that is void of 
refreshing, right? And so we get this vision drain. If you're feeling a 1% vision drain sitting in your living room today, right here. If you're feeling a 10% vision drain, Mike, if you're feeling a 40% or maybe you're here like Justin, if I'm honest, I'm feeling a 92% vision drain. I have a good word for you. I have a good word for you that the Holy Spirit wants to meet you today, that he wants to do something in your heart that changes you. He wants to ignite personal vision on the inside as you have never known before. I believe God's given me a prophetic word for the house today. And it's that now is the time that he is blowing his wind across your heart today. And he's got new life from the Holy Spirit. Come on, somebody say amen. That if you believe it today, he's got new life from the Holy Spirit for you to come alive in Jesus name. Come on, just look at that person next to you. Tell them, come alive today. Come alive today. You don't have to touch them if you don't want to because we're socially distancing. But I love, how the, I love how the text begins. It says the hand of the Lord. Did you notice that? The hand of the Lord was upon me. This is so important. This is so important because vision can't be me driven. You know, uh, successful business leaders, successful entrepreneurs, they've had me driven vision. And oftentimes when we think of vision from a business context, we think of it and it's all about getting for me. But Jesus said, if you ever want to find your life, you have to lose your life, right? If you ever want to be great, you have to serve. The kingdom of God is upside down. And so if you ever want to know deep fulfillment, it can't be a me driven vision. Me driven vision in the end might lead to accomplishment, that, but that accomplishment will always be defined by an emptiness because a God driven vision is the only thing that's going to bring you to a place of deep fulfillment. That's why the text starts with the hand of the Lord was upon me. See, he was in God's hand. It was about God igniting vision in our hearts. And I want to be clear as we get into this series about personal vision. This is not about you getting everything you ever dreamed for or ever wanted. It's about you discovering that God has a plan for you that's even better than what you could have dreamt up on your own anyways, and submitting and surrendering to that plan, finding that plan, discovering that plan, and fully giving yourself in sacrifice to that plan will actually make you more fulfilled to the glory of God and the good of your own heart for days to come. And so that's what this is about to see dead things come alive by God's spirit in you. And I really believe over these next few weeks, we're gonna be looking at the anatomy of vision, the birthplace of vision, how to grow vision, where to uh, take vision as it begins to mature in us. And as we look at all of these different elements of vision, I really believe that this is gonna be a time where God launches you into clarity, into specificity, into purpose, and into passion for the vision he has for your life. And so you can tell the person next to you, we tuned in to Sunday at Vox the right week in Jesus' name. Come on, we tuned in the right week. I love where God takes Ezekiel to birth a vision. Where does he take him? It says he set me in the middle of a valley. That is not the number one place that people want to go to find vision, the middle of a valley. I think some of us worship a God that we think only takes us to the tops of mountains, you know? They said, oh God, if, if, if you know, he's going to lead me and it's always going to be blessed, it's always going to be favored, but what we see from the beginning of the story is it says he he set me in a valley. And then I love the awkwardness of the text in this first verse and second verse. He says, and he led me back and forth. Everybody say back and forth, back and forth. Just picture it. Picture Ezekiel walking back and forth through these bones. Why would God bring Ezekiel to a low place and then make him walk back and forth, back and forth? Well, it's clear why he's doing it because he's trying to grow something inside Ezekiel that is essential when vision is to be born. And there's a lot of, you know, names that people have given it through the centuries, an unction, a passion. I like the word burden, a burden. A lot of times we don't think burden is a good thing, but a God-given burden is actually an incredible gift from God. It's an incredible gift. I can remember so clearly, 17 years old at a church service in Louisiana, maybe a 30-year-old or so preacher was up talking, and he taught on the passage of Scripture where Jesus says, what would it profit a man if he gains the whole world, but he forfeits his own soul? And the preacher made one point, young guy, made one point. As a 17-year-old kid, I was sitting there listening to everything he said. He made one point. He said, one human soul 
is more valuable than all the treasures of this world put together. Now, if you've been around Vox a long time, you've heard me say that so many times because in that moment, a paradigm shift occurred in my heart as a 17-year-old kid. I heard that and I thought, wait, all my plans, wait, all my, all my goals, all my dreams, they don't make any sense if that's true. One human soul is worth more than all the treasures of the world put together and it caused inside of me a burden to start to grow, a burden for people to meet Jesus. I was gripped. I was gripped by a burden. I remember shortly after that, I started college and I was working with my dad as a painter at that time. And one day we were painting this lady's house and I felt compelled to share Christ with her. She was very, very old and very, very sick and very, very close to crossing the line into eternity. And I talked with her for a while about Jesus. And I remember so clearly, I can still see her face in my mind. She said to me, honey, I don't even remember this lady's name. She said, honey, I'm old and I've lived my whole life. I'm not going to start believing in Jesus now. And I remember I left her house after finishing that painting project that we were working on. And I was driving my 1998 Saturn. Yeah, they don't even sell those anymore. uh, Out of her driveway and down the street. And I had to pull over on the side of the road because I wept and wept and wept for a woman who was so close to eternity with no desire to know or follow Jesus. And God began to grow in me for a person I hardly knew, a divine burden, a divine burden, a burden. See, when you begin to look at the great visionaries of scripture, what you'll discover is the vision always begins in the valley. You remember where Nehemiah, who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, first came to that place where he felt the passion to go. It was when he heard that the city had been burned and it says he wept and he mourned for days. He felt the burden of God. If you remember Moses, his entire journey as a deliverer began with a sense of rage when he saw the Egyptian abusing the Israelite, right? When you look at David, where did God launch him into his destiny? But in the valley where he had to face Goliath, right? And so again and again and again, some of us, listen to me right Right now, you're feeling like you're in a valley and your plan in this valley is to exit as soon as possible. And I believe that the spirit of the Lord would say to you, why are you so eager to get out of the valley when I'm trying to give you a burden? Would you not just walk around for a little while? Would you not just look to the left and to the right? Would you begin to see the brokenness around you and enable me on the inside, open up to me, changing you, transforming you? Look around at the crumbling family that is your extended family. Look around at the brokenness. He left her. Now the child's grown up without a dad. All the mess that occurred. He's still drinking way too much. It's a disaster. Look around at the broken family. Does it bother you? Look around at the injustice that you see. The people that have been passed over. The inconsistencies in our society. Look around at your neighborhood. People so busy with this and that. More concerned with their lawn than they are with their souls. Look around a little bit longer and allow the spirit of God to start to grow in you a burden. Come on, somebody say amen. Amen. A burden. I remember years ago hearing a story about D.L. Moody, a great preacher from another generation. He was seeing incredible success in all of the UK and a bunch of uh, high-browed pastors came and met with Moody and they said, why is this simple man so successful in his ministry? So many coming to faith in Jesus. So many lives changed. The crowds are massive. Why are you so effective? And Moody brought him into his office and he said, look out that window. What do you see? And they looked out the window and below there was a park, kids playing in the park, people walking their dogs and everything. They said, um, we, we, um, we see a park with people in it. And he looked back at them and he said, but I see countless souls who will one day spend eternity in hell if they do not find their savior. See, vision doesn't begin on the mountain. Jot this thought down, vision is born out of a need. Vision is born out of a need. See, friend, what I want you to understand is there's something in this world that God has uniquely called you to make right. There is a difference in this world that God has uniquely called and equipped you to make. There's something, he's designed you right now Right now, through this camera, right now in this room, God's given you fresh vision for the type of family that he's called you to lead. Right now, God's given you fresh vision for ministry, fresh vision for the arts, fresh vision for business. He's calling you to something beyond yourself. Don't avoid the valley. Walk back and forth a little bit longer. 
And I love what happens next in verse three. Look at it with me. He asked me, this is God speaking to Ezekiel. He asked me, son of man, look at this. Can these bones live? Have you ever reflected on the power of a question? Can these bones live? You know, all through the Bible, we see God asking people profound questions. All the way back to the first story, Adam sins. And he says, Adam, where are you? I love that. It's not as though God lost Adam. He didn't like lose track of where he was. He knew exactly where Adam was, but he wanted Adam to know where Adam was. And he was trying to teach Adam that no matter where you are in life, if you're out of step with God, you're not home. And so he asks a profound question. Later in the scripture, I love when Moses is insecure about his call to go and be a deliverer in Egypt. And God says to Moses to ease his insecurities. He says, what's that in your hand? And if you know the story, Moses has in his hand a staff. And God is teaching Moses something powerful. powerful. He's saying, listen, if you'll just work with what you have, I'll transform it into what you need. And so the question empowered him to go and make a difference. So questions can change the whole trajectory of your life. I can remember certain questions in my journey that changed everything. I was 21 years old listening to a guy preach in Germany in a big church service. And as I sat there listening to him through a translator, he asked one simple question that I've brought into so many sermons because it so powerfully impacted my life. He said, does your life make sense in the light of eternity? That's a question that can change everything. Just this past week, I was with my, my brother-in-law, and we were at Walmart. And uh, I can't remember what we were getting at Walmart, batteries, I think. But we were at Walmart, and we were just talking about life. And, and he said, you know, I've been meeting with a, another businessman that's been challenging me. And recently, this person asked me, he said, what do you want to accomplish? Write it down, the five, ten goals that you want to accomplish before you die. And in the Walmart parking lot, I felt a little spark in my heart when he said that. I felt that little spark of vision because questions have a powerful impact on the soul. The right question to an open heart can change everything. And I love what God asks Ezekiel. He says, can these bones live? Oh, there's so much in that question. Can these bones live? Well, practically no, right? Practically, bones cannot live. How many of us have taken a bag of bones and seen it transformed into a human being? Zero, right? It's not a common occurrence. Can these bones live? And yet God is inviting Ezekiel into a different way of thinking. I like to call it pliable possibility. You might want to jot that thought down. Pliable possibility. What is pliable possibility? P pliable possibility is the truth that God invites his children to expand the borders of reality through acts of faith. It's a real thing in the scriptures. This is why Jesus says, if you say to this mountain, move, by faith, it can move. He says, all things are possible for him who believes. He says, greater things will you do because I've gone to the Father. Whoa, 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 you're saying greater things than what Christ did in the miracles that he saw we can see? That doesn't seem to register with the rational mind. But Jesus is saying, you've got to shift your perspective out of what you think is possible and into what God says is possible. You've got to begin to ask some crazy questions. Can these bones live? I mean, no, but... But maybe. I remember years ago reading a quote by George Bernard Shaw. He said, you see things and you say, why? But I dream of things that never were. And I say, why not? Where in your life are you looking at an impossible situation and saying, why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not our church get healthier and stronger through a time where everything should be getting smaller and more separated? Why not community grow in the midst of a time where it's more difficult to get together? You might be here and say, why not? Why not be the first person in my family to ever graduate from college? Why not raise a healthy family even though everything I've seen from past generations was abusive and broken? Why not overcome this addiction that's defined my family line year after year after year? Why not grow and change and become more than what I've seen around me? Why not be used by God to see someone else place their faith in Jesus and their entire trajectory and eternity change? See, vision is born out of a need, but then vision expands. You can jot this down with the right questions. Vision expands with the right questions. It is time for you first to begin to study the, your own soul and the burdens that God's called you towards and then begin to ask some bigger questions. Why not?
Why not God use me? You know, I have people tell us all the time. In fact, today, somebody was talking to me earlier. And they were just saying, you know, the vision and the dreams that we have for New England are crazy. You know, we talk here at Vox a lot about believing God, that we will see in our lifetime New England, the least church region in the United States, transformed into the most spiritually vibrant place on earth. And in the practical and the natural, that many people meeting Jesus, that many people changing the way they live and how they think, it seems so irrational, it seems so impossible. I got two, questions, two, two words for you. Why not? Why not? Can these bones live? You're now entering into the realm of vision. Can these bones live? Look at what happens in verse four, I love it. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones, you gotta speak to it and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I'll make breath enter you and you will come to life. I'll attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you'll come to life. Then you'll know that I'm the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. As I was prophesying, there was a noise. Let's look at that, a noise, a rattling sound. And these bones came together bone to bone. A rattling sound, a noise. You know, when our church started, that's what we were. We were just a noise. We were just a disturbance, just a little rattling sound. See, some people think, you know, when God is in it, everything falls into place. Friend, that is maybe the most unbiblical idea that we have embraced in our society today. I mean, it, you, you look in the Bible, ask Noah. Like, how'd you feel for 100 years building a boat? Well, it should have been easy if God's in it. No, I think God was in it. And yet it was not easy. Ask Paul who was abused and shipwrecked and a thousand other things, just as we saw last week. Well, if he lived by the theology that if God's in it, it should be easy, then he would have stopped a long time ago. Ask Esther, who had to risk her life to save her nation. It wasn't easy. It wasn't simple. It was difficult. It was challenging. And so often God pushes us to these challenging places, and it's a noise. It's a noise. One of my favorite things about this passage is that God never answers the question that he asks Ezekiel. He never says, hey, Zeke, just so you know, the, the bones will live. He never does it. He asks the question, and then he, he demands that Ezekiel prophesies. And I think there are a lot of us that you've got some questions in your heart that you're wanting God to answer. And you say, well, if he would just answer that, then I'd be sure. Well, if he would just tell me, then I'd be confident. Well, if he just called me to step out and made it super clear and everything fell into place, then I would step out in faith. Then I would have a great vision. Then I would believe him. You don't realize you're actually missing the call of God because you're waiting for God to answer a question that he's called your act of faith to answer. I love what Leonard Ravenhill said. He said, the opportunity of a lifetime needs to be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. The opportunity of a lifetime needs to be seized. And so he tells Ezekiel, prophesy. I'm not gonna answer the question for you. I'm gonna pose the question and call you to prophesy, prophesy. And he begins to describe this process as Ezekiel obeys God. I love the process. It says it starts with the rattling, with the bones coming together, and then tendons, and then flesh, and then skin. So like a four-part process, right? And I think that this is a picture for us of how vision grows in our lives. It starts with a skeleton, an outline. It starts just with a skeleton. And you know, you start to put the bone onto bone and you start to get a sense for what God's called you to. And then you start to connect the pieces. Those are the tendons, right? You start to say, well, how does this fit with that? And I don't even think that's a hip bone. I think that's a leg and, or an arm and, and I got to move it. And, you know, you, how does it all fit together, right? And then after it's kind of fit together, you make it one vision. That's what the flesh does. That under, you know, uh, flesh that you don't see, but it's right below your skin, right? And then the last stage it says is the skin that comes on this being and so that's the waterproofing. That's what makes it airtight. That's what makes it presentable. And so you can see that vision kind of follows this pattern. It starts with an outline, and then you begin to wrestle with how those things fit together, and then you start to focus it and pull it all into one, and then you make it presentable. You put some skin on it. You make it look right. You make it communicable, something you can tell others, right? And so what we see is a process that we're uh, having outlined for us through this vision that Ezekiel gets. First, that it begins with a need through a divine burden, and then from from there, you begin to ask the right questions. And then thirdly, jot this down, vision moves ahead through a system. Through a system. Vision moves ahead through a system. Now, some people are systems people. Come on, in the room today, 
Who loves systems, a good system? I know, I know Anna can build some systems. You know that Lisa loves some systems. There's some people that are good at systems. You might be watching this today in your living room. You're like, oh, systems, good. I love systems. I like this part. Well, one of the biggest mistakes people make with vision is they start with the system before they ever got the burden. And so you can't start with a system. To start with a system gets a great plan that goes nowhere. You have to start with the burden and then from that deep burden begin to ask some crazy questions, some pliable possibility questions. And then from there begin to answer those questions with a system, right? Now, some of us, you hear that and Vox has even been accused of this. You say, system, system's not spirit led. To be led by the spirit, you don't need a system. You just go where the wind blows. Did you know that the wind has a system? Do you know that everything that God built has a system? You know that every little apple has seeds in it because that's a system to reproduce after its own kind? You know that the human body is made up of systems, that if the systems in your body stopped working, you'd be dead right now? That everything God created has, is a system because God is a systems God and he's called us to be systems people and if you're ever gonna find the vision God's called you to, you've got to embrace this idea that certain things must and can follow a pattern that enables growth. And so the system requires that you ask, what are the steps for us to get there? I love being a part of the vision of Vox Church because we're asking that right now. Like when we say we have a vision, I'm not gonna unpack the whole thing for you today. When we have a vision to see New England become the least church, from the least church region to the most spiritually vibrant place on earth, we actually are in the process of really setting in place the systems to see that happen to see hundreds of churches in every town and city across New England so that through the local church, we can make disciples, we can reach the lost, we can share the gospel, we can love our neighbor. See, we're actually creating a system for the vision because it's not enough to have a burden. It's not enough to ask big questions and dream. Then you gotta build the system. Come on, look at the person next to you and tell them, build the system. Build the system. You gotta build the system. But once the system is built, Something strange happens. It's my favorite part. Verse eight. So he prophesies, and I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on the skin and covered them. Look at this next sentence. But there was no breath in them. Isn't that weird? God builds the whole person, but they're still dead. No good. He goes from bones to a human and then stops. Why would he stop? Why not just do it in one miracle? Why does he stop Ezekiel and say, okay, now you got to prophesy again, right? I already prophesied. Just do it in one shot. Make the whole system work. I believe it's because God's trying to teach us something very critical about vision for your life and more importantly, for your heart. You can have a burden. You can ask the right questions. You can create a system and it can still be lifeless. Because God is teaching your heart a truth that is uncomfortable for many of us. And it is that every breath belongs to him. That apart from me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Nothing? Nothing. Nothing. You can do nothing. Well, I could do a lot of things. I pulled myself up on my bootstraps. I built my own business. I, 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 I built my family. I, I, I bought this house. Ba, 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 ba. No, 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 no. The breath you have in your lungs, the synapses firing in your brain, the big pump that's pumping blood through your body, all those things belong to God. All those things are common grace given to you from the Spirit of God. You must confront the uncomfortable truth that you are completely and utterly dependent upon Him. And if you conceive in your own mind a reality in which you are not dependent, that is a false reality that will destroy the life in your vision. You have got to come to terms with complete submission, with holy dependence, with radical surrender. And then from that position of surrender, begin to cultivate a confidence in a God who has a better plan for you than you had for yourself. So you look at the people of, of scripture and you see great visionaries like Jacob, but God had to give him a limp before he could make him Israel. You look at people like Peter who had passion, who had courage, but God had to humble him and show him his own sin before he could launch him as a great apostle. 
You look at Paul, who was well-learned and had all the education of the brilliant minds of his day, and yet God had to blind him and knock him down before he could ever use him to change the world. See, in all these instances, your heart must learn a profound truth about God-inspired vision. Jot it down. This is the truth that vision only becomes reality through the breath of God. It only becomes reality through the breath of God. And so I'm calling this sermon today, how to build a hurricane, how to build a hurricane, because there's basically three ingredients to a hurricane. The first is the hot, humid air that comes up off the ocean. That's the first ingredient in a hurricane, this hot air that comes up. But then the second ingredient is this cold air of the atmosphere that comes down. And when those two forces collide, it's the beginning of vision. So imagine the hot, humid air as your passion, as your dream, as your big plan. But then imagine this cold air really as your dependence on God, as your utter and absolute need for him, as the truth that apart from him, you can do nothing. So now when the hot air of a big dream meets the cold truth of your inability, you're just missing one thing. And that's the wind. See, when that hot air meets that cold atmosphere and then the wind all the way from Africa blows across the Atlantic and hits that air, it begins to turn it and things start to spin faster and faster and faster, fueled by the hot air, pushed by the cold air and a hurricane that can change the landscape begins to form. And so I felt like God gave me a word for your heart today. And it's this, I believe that the Lord would say to you, the wind is blowing now. The wind is blowing now. But if you will take a big dream and if you will fully surrender it, I will take my wind and I'll make it come alive. I'll make it a force that changes the world. The wind is blowing now. Will you dream a little bigger? Will you surrender a little more? The wind is blowing now. Will you allow those two forces to combine in your own heart so that now God's wind can take you further than you've ever gone before? You say, Justin, I've been living with a vision drain. I had plans for 2020. 2020, the year of vision. And yet everything I planned has been crumbled. It's crushed. It's barely even surviving. Nothing I plan looks like it was supposed to look friend maybe all of that crushing is to get you to a place where you fully surrender to a God-given vision for your life I'm prophesying to you right now the wind is blowing the wind is blowing and so wherever you are right now in your living room watching this in your kitchen would you stand up with me Right now, come on, just stand right up. And even everybody here, let's just stand. Let's just invite the Holy Spirit. Come, oh God. Come, oh God. Would you close your eyes? Close your eyes. Take the next 20 seconds. Reflect upon what you've heard and answer that question. Am I experiencing right now a vision drain Am I in vision depleted? Is that where I am right now? Is that where I find myself? Maybe in the past you were able to keep that spark alive with the right entertainment, the right vacation, and yet as all of that's been stripped away, you find there's a lack of personal vision in your life. You don't carry a burden from God, or maybe that burden's just grown cold. You're not asking big questions anymore. You're just thinking about survival. Oh, come Lord Jesus. You're not building systems for the future. You're just hiding in a cave. If you're here and you say, Justin, I feel like I'm experiencing vision drain. This applies to everybody in the room and everybody that's watching online. You say, I feel like I'm experiencing vision drain. I want to pray for you. And the Spirit of God is going to touch your life today. Would you lift up your hands? Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. God, I believe you spoke to my heart 
and you said the words, the wind is blowing. The wind is blowing. And so I communicate that to the church right now. The wind is blowing. The wind is blowing now. So would you take a big dream and would you take a surrendered heart and would you allow those two forces to collide on the inside and trust that God even now is going to stir a hurricane on the inside of your heart. Lord Jesus, I thank you for greater dreams. I thank you for bigger vision. Lord, forgive us for stopping and not, not asking the big questions anymore. Forgive us, God, for allowing our passions to grow cold. Spirit of Jesus, would you move right now through this camera in this room and would you ignite in our hearts fresh vision from heaven. Holy Spirit, wind of God, set our hearts ablaze with vision. God, I pray that even this week as the first week of this Dream That Dream series, that even now you'd begin to stir inside of us fresh vision, a new invitation Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. I'm asking in Jesus' name. Come, Holy Spirit. And breathe on your people right now. Just whisper this to God. Say, I receive fresh vision. Fill me, Lord. I receive fresh vision. Fill me, Lord. One more time. I receive fresh vision fill me Lord thank you oh God thank you God in Jesus name in Jesus name I want to talk just for a moment for the person that can hear my voice right now and you are far from God you're not right with God. Maybe you tuned in because a family member or a friend told you about Vox Church. Maybe you're new to the whole church. Maybe you've never been to one of our in-person gatherings in your life. But you can hear my voice right now and you're far from God, friend. It is not an accident. It is not coincidence. God's spirit is calling you home. You need to know right now that there is one who had a burden for you. There is one who is driven and compelled by compassion to save you from sin and to rescue you from hell. And that is God himself, that he came, that he became like us, lived a perfect life that we could not and died on the cross as a substitute for your sin and mine. And when he shed that blood, Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price and gave the ultimate sacrifice so that you could have peace forever with God. That peace is available right now. It's not a fairy tale. It is for you, and he offers it right through the screen. He offers it to you right now by faith. He calls you home. See, true vision never comes alive until you see the vision of God's love for you. He so loves you that he gave his one and only son. And if you would place your faith in what Christ did for you, you'd receive peace with God, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. You can't earn it, and you and I, we don't deserve it, but he calls you home right now. I want to invite you to pray a prayer of surrender to Jesus right now because he didn't just die on that cross for your sins when his body sat in that tomb for three days because he followed the vision of heaven. The breath of God breathed on him and that vision came alive and he walked out of that tomb so that he could take the resurrection life from heaven and put it in your soul today. He's got peace for you right through this screen. He's got peace for your soul. Would you bow your head? Would you pray this prayer of faith with me right now? Say, Jesus, save me. Today I surrender my life. I believe you died and rose from the dead. I place my trust in you. Make me new. I give you my life. Today I receive peace. Amen. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, text the word Jesus to the number on the screen. We would love to pray for you, stand with you in your decision. Friend, I'm telling you, all of our church, everybody that can hear my voice right now, I'm telling you, these next few weeks, God is going to set your heart on fire with some personal vision. So take the roadmap that we outlined today, begin working through it. Begin asking God to increase the burden in your heart, to give you a deeper passion and a deeper zeal. Begin to ask God to break your heart for the things that his heart breaks for. And then begin to ask some bigger questions. 
begin to develop that system. Let's begin the process of fresh vision in our own hearts and lives this week. I'm going to pray for you, then we're going to close. Father, I thank you for this church family. I thank you for what you're doing in us, and I thank you for the now word that says that the breath of God, the wind of God is blowing. I pray in Jesus' name that you bring us to a deeper, deeper place of surrender and that you enable us by your spirit to dream bigger dreams. I thank you for what you're doing in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you.